I'm Carol Pierre-Drews, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications here at the IAB, and I'm here with my pup, Mika. And I am so thrilled to say that I'm here with another fantastic or fantastic founder, Ronaldo Webb, who is the founder of Pet Plate. Ronaldo is here to talk to us a little bit about his company and his journey in, in creating that company. And then we'll get back together and we'll hear more about what he has planned for its future. Ronaldo, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. And, you know, Cooper, our chief tasting officer, as we like to call him in the business, uh, will you know be joining us a little bit. Hopefully we won't hear him uh, during the, uh, the actual chat. But, uh, you know, this is one of the inspirations for Pep Plate here um, for us. So, you know, really happy to be interviewing with a, a, a similar pet parent. Great. Welcome, Cooper. <laughs> All right, great. Well, uh, so again, hello again, Ronaldo, founder of uh, Pet Plate, and you know, really to uh, kind of get started in terms of Pet Plate, founder story, etc. My journey, starting right after college, I was a consultant working primarily, you know, at large private and public companies, and just by happenstance, I spent a lot of time at pet food factories, and I saw all the ingredients going into you know our you know family members' food. So whether it's animal meal um, or kind of all kinds of other, you know, preservatives, high cooking temperatures. And I decided that, you know, my dogs really needed something healthier to really support their health and longevity. And that led me to starting Pet Plate. I started the business back in 2016. And you know, when I quit my private equity job and started biking around New York City, cooking and delivering dog food myself, it was a really fun journey. It led me to being on Shark Tank and really evolving and growing a brand that, you know, is, uh, I think really touched the lives of many pet parents and improved the lives of many pets across the country. You know, really quickly at Pet Plate, you know, our mission is to, you know, you know, drive deeper, more meaningful and long relationships with pets and pet parents. And then we do that through exceptional quality dog food. It's rooted in science and designed to deliver the essential nutrients they need to live a long and happy life. You know, what really differentiates Pet Plate is, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, how we go through all of the you know hard work in terms of providing the healthiest and easiest way to feed your dog. So for us, it all starts with human grade ingredients. It all goes back to my time working at pet food facilities where I saw the ingredients going into the food. You know, realize that you know using higher quality ingredients will just lead to better health outcomes, and that's allowed us to work at USDA facilities. Um, we match that with personalized meal plans. So all of Pet Plate's meals are pre-portioned into uh, individual serving size containers. So that you know, it's very easy to go through and feed your dog breakfast or dinner and everything is pre-portioned based on the number of calories they need, which we find out through a very simple conversion flow on our website. And then things are safely and easily delivered directly to your door. This has obviously been a real big boom for our business, um, you know, during kind of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been able to retain tons of those customers as they've just seen the extra additional value we've been able to provide. So with all of that, you know, we've had a really exciting and successful run with the business as we've, you know, really grown over the past couple of years, starting in 2017. And the business has, you know, evolved um, since then. And really taking you know, our products from first our fresh cooked entrees. Uh, we you know, started right now with four flavors and we've been able to move to a more diverse product assortment in terms of marketing. You know, we were very much a digitally um, first and digital native brand. And now we're really focused on different like multi-channel marketing opportunities. So really branching out from the standard Facebooks, Instagrams, et cetera, of the world. And in terms of distribution, we've been making the move from being a direct-to-consumer um, subscription business model, which matched really nicely with us being a digitally native brand, to moving to more of a more omni-channel business. And now we're in upwards of 150 retail stores across the U.S. And obviously our brand has continued to evolve and continued, in my opinion, to really, you know, I think drive a really important, um, you know, point on just the connection between pets and pet parents and why that's important and how you can help deepen that relationship. So just a real quick, you know, background on Pet Plate, you know, where we've been and where we're going and, you know, excited to dive into more questions. That's fantastic, Ronaldo. What a great story. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about what you just said, I mean, it, it just makes absolute simple sense. You know, it's like healthier food 
means healthier dog. Yeah. So I'm sure those sharks must be kicking themselves for, you know, <laughs> not, you know, letting this big catch get away um, or for letting the big catch get away, I should say. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit more about your business model. I love that you were saying that, you know, you started out direct to consumers. So when did you start to branch out into the retail outlets and really get into that omni-channel marketing? It's really been a very recent development for us. So we started initially by offering e-commerce checkout on our website. So not being available on Amazon's or Chewy's, but really still trying to make sure that we can, uh, you know, own that customer experience and, uh, you know, provide the additional value to our customers. So we allowed them to buy some of our organic treats and supplements as one-off purchases or in four packs on our website. And then really kind of the pull for healthier human grade food has led retailers across the US. So brick and mortar retailers to reach out to us about different retail tests and different pilot tests and having our food available in freezers across the US. You know, for us, we thought that was really important because we wanted to prove out that pet plate was not just a coastal phenomenon where people in New York and LA are buying, you know, human grade food for their dogs, but that it can exist all over the US and in, in, in middle America. And we've been able to do that and do that across retail. So Pet Supplies Plus was our flagship retail partner. And soon we're going to be rolling out to additional, uh, you know, leading independent uh, pet retailers across the across the country. So uh, we started that in June. And since then, we've been the top moving fresh cooked human grade brand across our different retail partners, which we've been excited about. And we're just looking to deeper in that relationship. We think there's some synergies for us to be able to help these retailers provide a better level of personalization to their customers that we want to help them with. And all of the, you know, new innovation that's happening, you know, post COVID and these brick and mortar retailers. So for example, buy online, pick up in store, a lot of them are now doing direct delivery to home. It's a really interesting, um, you know, time. And we just want to make sure that we're participating in all of the, you know, the new growth that's happening across the different categories in the pet space. Yeah, it sounds like you're being really smart and thoughtful about still taking care of that one-to-one -one relationship that you have with your consumer and then also digging into the retail side. Do you think that your business strategy is going to change as you grow one side more than the other? Or how is that sort of evolving? Yeah, I, I really think that as we kind of continue to grow both channels, we plan to, you know, stay core to our direct-to-consumer subscription roots. But, you know, as we, you know, see things developing in retail, maybe there'll be the opportunity for different product SKUs or different flavors, um, you know, across that to really kind of differentiate the different business lines. Uh, we also really see retail in our ways as like a form of trial and also to cater to people that don't want yeah, subscription. When we look at, you know, um, subscription fatigue and reasons for churn, you know, getting a monthly box of dog food just doesn't work for everybody if they don't have the refrigerator or freezer space. So we want to really grow these channels um, uh, together and have them work in like a very like a symbiotic, you know, relationship. So that's more of how we're thinking about it is how can they feed off of each other and really create like that flywheel of growth. And over time, we'll look at the unit economics and see what makes the most sense for the business. But, you know, I suspect that will be more heavily weighted to direct consumer subscription, but finding and pushing customers that do better buying in store, you know, to our different retail partners. Yeah. So, and you said that, you know, it sounds like there are different types of consumers, right? So there's the solution seeker who's using um, pet plate as that everyday meal for their dog. And then there's also those ones who are, you know, looking for a moment to spoil people, spo spoil their dog. Yes. Um, so they're not necessarily doing that monthly subscription. So how are you looking at um, segmenting and then also creating products that you might want to funnel specifically to a, a, a certain customer segment? Yeah. It all comes down to data and making sure that particularly on our online platform, we're collecting the right data points, understand how users are actually utilizing pet plate, bucketing them appropriately across the personas and then having very personalized, you know, email or text message flows to help drive the behavior we're looking to see. So for example, people that, uh, you know, are ordering toppers plans on our website and they've been consistent customers identifying that and reaching out to them and really providing the information they need to make the decision to switch to a more full-time meal plan is a strategy, for example, or finding the people that are to your point, maybe ordering once every couple of months and realizing that, you know, or they have uh, paused because they have too much food, identifying those customers and having them in a specific email flow that's 
based on zip code, letting them know what retailers are available for them to go buy a plate in store, right? So now the retailers are excited as we're driving business to them. We're excited because we're really retaining a customer um, through a different channel as opposed to them leaving and finding a, another brand um, uh, you know, that might better fit their needs. So, you know, really it's just kind of what granularity of data can you get and then how can you design you know, the communication flows via email or text message to drive that behavior. Yeah, it sounds like you're really in tune with the customer and listening to them. Uh, I mean, that idea of like taking them from online ordering and offering up, hey, you can go to this retailer to buy your product is really smart. And um, I wish a lot of more brands would, would do that sort of thing and really think about how the customer is, is shopping because it is about the convenience and, and understanding how they're thinking about how they want to um, consume a particular product. Mm -hmm. um, you know, supply chain issues, that's a big thing right now, right? We're hearing it left and right everywhere. And you talked again at the beginning about the influx of, of pet parents and more people, you know, adopting dog, dogs or you know, hopefully getting a dog from a irreparable breeder, right? So how is Pet Plate dealing with the demand right now? Um, sounds like you're doing very well, but love to hear some, some you know, strategies or tactics, because I'm sure the audience that we've got here today, a lot of founders and um, you know, startup folks as well, and also incumbent brands who wanna hear a little bit about what your strategy is for dealing with um, supply chain issues. You know, are there business decisions that you're making um, to help overcome, overcome some of the supply chain failures? Yeah, I mean, just like every business, you know, we've been experiencing, you know, challenges. I think what we've done great at Pet Plate is develop some very specific strategies to insulate our customers from realizing anything's going on. So, if you hop on petplate.com, you know, unlike a lot of brands, we don't have banners that your orders are going to be delayed, et cetera. And we've been able to do this just from a, a strategy of making sure we're diversifying risk across our supply base as well as our um, as well as our in supply chain that is kind of shipping the inboxes to the consumers. So we work with multiple USDA manufacturers to, if, if there's capacity issues at one, we can flex and you know, order product from, from, the, from the other. We also really tend to work with USDA facilities, and this is very specific to pet food here, but we're working with larger USDA kitchens that you know, have the extra capacity and extra space where they can also flex their demand. So that ends up being like a really interesting strategy that we first started applying on the food production side that we've then taken to the actual supply chain. And we work with, you know, 3PL partners, you know, they again have multiple points of distribution across the U.S. So what we found is that a lot of these supply chain issues are either very, they're very specific on like a type of material or a labor shortage in a certain area that's moving across the country. And if you can then be very like responsive and dynamic to that, it removes your ability to need to predict it and you can then flex your demand elsewhere. So if we only had two points of distribution or three points of distribution for shipping to our consumers instead of 10, right, we would have seen much more, uh, or have had much more impact on some of the supply chain and labor issues that are here. So I think it just kind of comes down to being very thoughtful about your supply chain and investing in it. A lot of brands only think about investing in marketing and maybe then they'll spend some money on retention marketing as well, but really just setting up a robust supply chain, making sure your suppliers are intact, you have redundancy plans at all levels. is kind of a, I think that it doesn't get bucketed as retention marketing, but it's a way to think about it in that sense. And that's how we've been able to uh, manage here. And it might lead to higher costs in the short term, but I think when you look at retention in the long run, making sure that customers understand your brand by you being reliable is a very important factor to take into account on your cost basis. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, thinking ahead about putting money into retention planning is super right. important. Yeah. Um, and you talked a bit about personalization before, um, and you talked about how you utilize data to predict product interests and things like that. Have you done anything with AI that, or are you thinking about AI? Yeah, we're definitely looking at leveraging more um, AI moving forward. You know, we've done it in a more manual process and we haven't automated it. So I think we've really flushed out what we would want AI to do. And now we're just kind of implementing that. And just to talk about how we think about personalization at Pet Plate. And when you hop on our website, there's a sh really quick quiz that you fill out on your dog for us to then personalize a meal plan. 
that meal plan is based off of calories. And now we're factoring in uh, ailments and allergies to help you find the right meals for your dogs. You know, the AI that's gone into this is looking across our, you know, customer service tickets, seeing what types of feedback and CSAT scores and MPS scores we're getting on meals, corresponding them back to breeds so that our CX agents now when someone emails in and has a question, the product specialist can really help guide them in the right direction. So we've been collecting all of these data points. Now, how do you take that, port it into a machine learning program that gets built into your CRM, built into our personalization flow, so it's automated. So we've done that on the conversion flow. We're looking to do that um, to really help out our CX agents a little bit more and finding ways of building that into uh, now our email marketing, for example, or our retention marketing of being proactive about, oh, this is the type of breed the dog has. These are the issues this customer should be focused on and the message points that they resonate best with. So there's going to be a journey to get there. Hopefully in the next couple of years, we can crack that and have it be a more automated uh, experience versus more of a manual uh, conversation. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I have been thinking about this, you know, you know, premium grade um, food for, for Mika. I haven't done it yet, but I'm, I'm getting close. <laughs> we'll get you a bot. We'll get you a sample. <laughs> I know. And she's, she's a mixed breed. So that's when you talked about the breed thing, that was something that I was always um, wondering about. Do you just like, I mean, she has her DNA, but do you normally just sort of take both of the breeds? Like if she's, she's a chow and a sharp page, do you just kind of look at the, you know, the, um, the backgrounds of those two breeds and then kind of figure out a formula that's going to work for those kind of mixed breed dogs? Yeah, we do. And what we really key in on is like specific issues we know that certain breeds run into. For example, if you had mentioned your dog it was a Labrador Retriever mix, right, which is a very popular mixed breed in America, you know, they're obese prone. So we would recommend one of our lower calorie dishes, you know, to make sure that, you know, they stay in a healthy weight range. Um, schnauzers, for example, um, notorious for getting pancreatitis. Again, we would recommend a low fat dish if there was a schnauzer mix in there. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to, you know, become integrated with an Embark, just to, you know, name one of the many DNA, dog DNA companies out there to, you know, better, uh, you know, improve the personalization experience and kind of drive the ease of using the data you have on your dog to, you know, make sure they're getting the best health outcomes. So all things we're thinking about and, you know, we'll kind of continue to work hard to achieve. Yeah, it's such interesting stuff. We did the wisdom panel for Mika to figure out her yep. DNA and it's just fascinating the things that you can find out just to find better food based on mm -hmm. your dog's breed is, is, is exactly. great. Um, so I know that you partnered with Paramount Pictures earlier this year with the Paw Patrol movie, super yep. cute. Um, and you delivered Pet Plate, these um, sort of movie theme boxes with a QR code where you can actually watch the trailer of the movie, mm -hmm. um, which I'd love to see um, or know, are you planning on doing any other kind of innovative, fun partnerships like that going forward with Pet Plate? Yeah. And, you know, and actually you do, I guess we, I get to make the announcement here. Hey, we <laughs> love announcements at BDS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a, we had a great experience working with the Paramount team. They were very thankful for all the hard work Pet Plate has done. And they actually have a, another movie, which is near and dear to my heart uh, on Clifford, the big red dog. That oh, Clifford. <laughs> their, their official dog food and dog treat sponsor uh, again. And again, doing ver very similar types of activations where, yeah, it's very symbiotic. You know, we obviously have, you know, a large list of customers that we can help educate and help them get very curated messages to and drive buzz for their movie. And then on our end, we love having, you know, fun activations to kind of, you know, have help our customers experience pet play in multiple forms of their life. So, you know, again, we're launching like a movie quiz. We're launching a, uh, a private screening for one of pet plates customers um, that they get to enter into a sweepstakes. And then on the Paramount side, as they're doing, you know, movie red carpets and, and theaters, Pet Plate will be there. And uh, the dogs of the, uh, you know, celebs will will get, you know, great Pet Plate treats uh, as a result of being able to go into the movie. So, you know, fun activations like that we really enjoy. You know, the Paw Patrol one was, you know, really exciting. We were able to take that to the next level, as you mentioned, with a branded box, which Again, just because we invested very heavily in our supply chain was something we were able to do relatively quickly. That wasn't necessarily an opportunity for uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog, but we're hoping to do more things like that in the future and to bring it into more different avenues. For us, we view it as a experiential marketing opportunity and doing that is just kind of an important way of getting out in front of consumers and providing more value to your current customers. 
so funny. I was going to ask you about experiential marketing too, because, you know, we're in the Zoom world, right? We're still yeah. in the Zoom world. <laughs> And um, we've had so much of that already, but people are getting back to live and in-person gatherings now. So um, I think there's a desire to get back to experiences. I know I want experiences. So wanted to understand like how you're thinking about experiential marketing and still, you know, even though you're getting out live, you still want to have some sort of like, you know, digital connection into that experience. Have you been thinking about that lately for uh, Pep? for pet plate. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really just finding, you know, fun and unique ways for, you know, uh, you know, people to, you know, bring their dogs and kind of enjoy like daily activities in life, right? To your point, people are looking to kind of get back out in, in the real world. And, you know, what we've seen work really well are, you know, these experiential type, type, um, uh, type marketing works. We did one thing called Dogville back pre-COVID and now we're starting to see these things bubble back up where people rent out spaces, they have fun little like art exhibits or kind of fun things for the dogs to do that are also kid friendly. So, you know, you know, families or people just looking for, you know, what am I going to do Saturday for an hour, have time to go out into like a new place, take their fun pictures. And that then ends up a way for Pet Play to share that across our social media platforms, use that in email marketing and just show that, you know, it, it just and it for for us it's really just bringing it back to the pet and pet parent connection right so we want to do experiential marketing because you know part of feeding your dog a healthier diet is being able to enjoy more things with them right so providing that outlet i think is really important and you know we've been finding partners that are kind of doing fun things on that end and being innovators in that space and you know for us it just makes a ton of sense to market that to our customer base and just continue to provide value to our to our users in any way that we can yeah, absolutely. And, you know, pets just, they are part of our family. They're our fur babies, yeah. um, just as part of um, anyone else's family. So um, great, great story. And um, we are almost at the end of our segment. So I would just say, you know, is there anything else you want to leave us with? Words of wisdom for the um, brand disruption community? Uh, you know, I think one thing I'd probably say is just in my experience at Pet Plate, where I found we've been successful is always going back to a data focused approach to like what the customer is telling you. Uh, and sometimes that goes against what your initial strategy was or what your initial thesis for the business was. I think really trust the data. Um, you have to have a little bit of your gut instinct there as well. But if you're finding that your you know, customers or a demographic where they may want to buy your product in a certain way, make that available as a test and see if it works. You may surprise yourself. If you find that certain creative really resonates with your user base, lean into that more and make sure that's what you're using across all of your social channels and your paid marketing channels. So I think just taking that extra step on looking the data has been really important for Pet Plate. It's changed how we've thought about everything from distribution to our product strategy. And, you know, sometimes I think uh, businesses look at the data a little bit too late um, as opposed to finding that right balance between gut instinct and uh, a data focused approach to your strategy. So true. Trust the data. Science and art will never fail you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ronaldo. This was really enlightening. I appreciate having you and Cooper here. And uh, we hope to see you again at another Brand Disruption Summit. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate the time.